her with us, uh, new a new presenter for us and um, important information for uh, people with lupus and lupus nephritis. So, uh, Mark, do you want to go ahead and introduce Dr. Kerr? Well, uh, good morning, everybody. As, as Amy said, uh, my name is Mark Miller. I'm with the Renia Pharmaceuticals and the Professional Relations Team. And I'd like to welcome you to today's virtual discussion, bringing lupus nephritis out of the shadows, sponsored by All In and Arinia. And it looks like uh, we are going to be holding a Q&A session at the end. But again, again, if you have questions along the way, please feel free to type them in. Um, do me a favor, uh, since this is really a patient-focused and unbranded program, uh, please keep any questions general in nature and re refer any specific questions about your health or treatments to your personal health care team. Today's presentation will not discuss any specific medicines and, and will focus on the importance of early detection and appropriate treatment of lupus nephritis. With that, I am pleased to introduce to you uh, our physician speaker this morning, Dr. Gail Carr. Dr. Carr is the Chief of Rheumatology in the Division of Rheumatology and Professor of Medicine at Howard University Hospital in Washington, D.C. She is also a professor at the Howard University College of Medicine. Dr. Carr, please begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, Mark, for the introduction and thank you to the organization for having me. Hello, Dr. Kim, it's good to see you again. And I'm glad to have everyone here to do, to, today. So I'm Gail Carr, I'm a rheumatologist now for a long time. 30 odd years in Washington, DC. And I work out of the VA Medical Center. And as you heard, I also have a clinic at Howard and started a program there and doing some clinical research. But I've also been involved for a long time with the teaching program at Georgetown University. We teach a fellows and residents there and also at USIS in Bethesda and I'm professor of medicine at all three institutions. So I see a lot of you lupus uh, patients and I have seen the angst that lupus patients can have and endure. My purpose today is really to empower, sensitize, and educate you on the topic of lupus nephritis. Uh, we're bringing it out of the shadows. And I wanted to do this because I believe knowledge is power and it allows you to have some shared decision-making with your provider so you can make the best possible decisions and also outcomes. So before we do that, um, let's uh, put things into context. And this is what I hate. There's a delay right in that. So lupus itself, and it's not an uncommon disease. We have um, uh, uh, patients who have it 200 to 300,000 in the population will have lupus, lupus disease itself. And of that about 100,000, will have lupus nephritis. It's, uh, a, if you can picture it, if those of you who watch football can picture this as, you know, about seven University of Michigan football stadiums packed full that will have lupus nephritis. And the disease, you know, is when our system goes off, off rail and we don't recognize ourselves anymore. And the system attacks as uh, sees it as foreign and we have basically a reaction to this with inflammation in many organs, but in the kidney, it's sort of a call for, for a call to arms for us to do something. The important thing is that almost 45 to 50% of patients will have uh, lupus nephritis, unfortunately. Most of them at disease diagnosis. Most of them at disease diagnosis, but if not within 10 years, you know, there's additional percentage, 10, 15, 20%, and so on. What you have to realize is that the beginning of this entity, lupus nephritis, it's as if there's a punch to a punching bag in a gym. And with each punch, there's subsequent inflammation and scarring. So when you get the first flare of lupus, you already have lost function. And the experts have said that you've lost about a third of your uh, kidney function by then because of this inflammation. So that's important to recognize and why we're gonna to talk today about early diagnosis. Uh, there's a lag, right. So it's a common place for it to happen in the kidneys entirely. And, um, and uh, we wanna learn about how we can certainly find the disease very early on to prevent this. It is important to recognize what the kidneys actually do, why it's going to be a problem. And what it does, it filters all the pollutants and toxins out of the system. You're familiar with the GI tract, you know what that does. But the kidneys primarily evolves 
chemicals, electrolytes, fluids, and balances these very delicately. So if it doesn't function well, we're gonna have troubles with the numbers, the electrolytes, the creatinine levels, the waste product, you're gonna retain fluid, you're gonna have swelling. And if it doesn't uh, have some kind of moderation and control of this and it goes on, the risk is real and that is of continuing decline in uh, kidney function, kidney failure, and that patients can go on to develop and need dialysis or transplant. So who gets this disease? Well, um, I think uh, it's gonna be the person who actually gets lupus and it's mostly women and it's women of color. So it's African-Americans, it's gonna be Hispanics. What I think is not appreciated is that a lot of Asian women also get this disease. With lupus nephritis, it's similar. And what we're gonna see is that, as I mentioned, of the 200 to 300,000 lupus patients in the US, 100,000 actually go on to develop lupus nephritis, one in three of us at the time of diagnosis. And it's much more common in African-Americans and Asians, fourfold higher than Caucasians and Hispanics twice as high. And it's been a problem for a long time. And these demographics have been known for a long time. And up until 2004, the survival rates of patients with lupus nephritis just shows that we couldn't get over the hump. We couldn't make any progress with all what we're doing. More recent data has suggested that we can. And I think, and that's at least from 2004 to 2012. I suspect going forward now with the new therapies we have and the way we do things, we're going to see that that improves. So it becomes even more important that we have the opportunity to diagnose and treat, that we recognize it very early and bring individuals in. And that profile has to be recognized. We also have to to realize that these individuals who are more prone to disease and who have more prevalent lupus, they're gonna be the ones that are in the lowest socioeconomic status. Those who are underinsured, who have less access to specialists. So they're gonna present much later in their disease, unfortunately. It's also related with men who I see as well in my practice and recognize that it's more severe. And also if you have a higher BMI, if you have high blood pressure, those are the individuals who are going to have more progression of disease, and those are the ones that we're going to have to target. Sorry for the lag in this. It's 12 o'clock, and everywhere on the East Coast is using the internet at this time. All right, so how would we recognize, or you could recognize that you have lupus nephritis? Well, if you realize that the kidneys gets rid of waste products and fluid, then you would probably recognize that you might have some weight gain in this as you retain fluid, because these are subtle findings, very, very subtle. And you might see that you have swelling in the legs. You might see that you have swelling in the feet and the ankles. You may also realize that you're getting up more often at night to go to the restroom. There's something happening there. And because this is related to the kidney's inability to retain the protein, they're losing it in the urine and also some blood, you will be designated as having lupus nephritis. But these are elements you cannot see. And that's why it's important for you to go to the lab, see a physician to get these entities checked. You may also notice when you look back into the toilet, you may see that the urine is frothy and that uh, there is something wrong here. The measurements that are done are done in the doctor's office. And we'll talk more about those with the creatinine levels and looking at the rates in which toxins are, the, are delivered out of the kidney or how the kidney functions, its filtration rate. And uh, the blood pressure is also a good indicator. Most people or most patients I know now have their blood pressure machines at home and do daily checks. This is very important to monitor for your general health, but certainly we have lupus nephritis. And it's important that we get a picture of what's happening inside the kidney. I'm gonna emphasize this more for you to see what's happening. The complications therefore of lupus nephritis are not always inside the kidney. 
I'm a rheumatologist and I see patients with lupus in general. And what we see is lupus outside the kidney happening as well in some instances. But a lot of times the disease is actually only active within the kidney. And uh, when that happens, we have to focus primarily on treating the disease. But even in that instance, the fact that you're having active inflammation in the kidney portends that there's problems gonna occur outside the kidney. And these include an increase in blood pressure. You have continual inflammation and scarring, that punching of the bag of the kidney, each punch is gonna be a scar and you're gonna have a decline in function in addition to the natural decline that everyone has with age, your slope is going to be steeper if you have continuing inflammation or frequent relapses of inflammation in the kidney. Patients with lupus nephritis have also been found to have higher cardiovascular complications. A study in Denmark showed that they had an eightfold increase uh, incidence of um, heart attacks, myocardial infarctions, and five-fold increase, four to five-fold increase of having a stroke. So important that we country information to avoid this. And again, the risk of having continuing kidney failure into end-stage renal disease. And studies have shown without the strict control and monitoring of kidney disease, what could happen is that at age 70, almost 70% 70 of lupus patients will end up with renal failure and require transplantation. And that's what we're here to talk about and avoid. So how do we get there? How do we get to detect this very early and get on top of it? Well, one thing to do is to have adherence with your follow-up visits with your physician, whether a rheumatologist, nephrologist, or your primary care physicians who can refer to each other to best treat the disease, because that's how you can have regular routine testing to detect lupus nephritis, which is vital. They detect this by checking the protein and the urine. And I will discourage you from having been told that you have one plus two plus or three plus urine as occurs usually in some offices with a dipstick. Because I will offer to you that a one plus dipstick doesn't mean that you have mild or insignificant disease. It could, but it's no guarantee. A one plus could certainly mean that you have significant proteinuria. And we'll talk about the numbers and that's what we need, a number, not a qualitative thing that says a one plus. It's also best to have these tested first thing in the, year, in the morning actually to get the best number. And also to check to see if there's any blood in the urine because these patterns sometimes can give an inkling, an idea of what type of damage is occurring in the kidney. These tests can be orders, as I said, by either a rheumatologist or a nephrologist or your primary care, but have them do it regularly. And we ask that you do that every three months, going and get your labs tested. If you have active disease or you find that the levels which were normal are slightly increasing, then you need to be checked more frequently. And then you should be at least monthly to see which way the disease is going, whether it's becoming active and whether we need early changes in your medications to do this. And it's often done at the office, doctor's office, but also in the lab as well to do. And, uh, you know, we say this all the time, and I think it's uh, in guidelines everywhere, but we know it doesn't happen. And that's the purpose of these programs, to have patients who have the disease become their advocate. The proof is, if you look at data out of um, University of California, San Francisco, where they looked at how good lupus patients were being monitored, it's evident that they were not. The patients were not having every three monthly uh, urine testing. It was maybe, maybe every six months. Everybody had their blood pressure checked because it's sort of by route with a vital sign with the temperature and weight. And very few actually had any uh, biopsies, and if they did, it didn't happen until as long as 12 months after presentation. And really, we want to sensitize you to the importance of having uh, uh, a biopsy much earlier than that. Because the diagnosis can be made by either one of our specialties. When we check and we see significant proteinuria, we immediately call in our colleague, the nephrologist. We, in turn, get referred patients because Sometimes lupus presents with only uh, renal involvement. 
And when they see this in the pattern, they call us to say, is lupus anywhere else? Let's see what's the best approach to management. And we work together uh, with the nephrologist. And this is often, I think, the best pairing for patients who have lupus nephritis to work with those. So it's vital to detect the, the urine, the protein in the urine. It can only be detected by testing. It also can detect blood in the urine because neither one of these you can see with your eyes. It's gonna require testing. The proteinuria, however, is the one that portends the worst prognosis, more so than the hematuria. And that is why we ask that you go in to have these checks. The creatinine levels are important. It tells us that the kidney is not filtering stuff out well. And I often explain to some of my patients, you know that strainer in the kitchen that you use and sometimes one of the little holes in it becomes scarred, knotted, fibrosed, closes up, and the, the strain in the kitchen doesn't work as well. Picture that in your kidneys, the same sort of thing that happens with each inflammatory process. And because of that, it retains things in the in the body, in the kidney, in the in the body itself. And we pick that up with a serum creatinine, and that's important. I mentioned kidney biopsy. And this is part of the investigation when you have a lupus nephritis. It's evolved into a very safe procedure. It involves interventional radiology. They do all the pre-procedure um, checks to make sure it's safe so your complications are minimal. Why is it important? Well, it's how we see what's happening inside the kidney. We get a picture of what's happening because the urine and the blood tells us it's not working well but we wanna get a precise image of what the inflammation looks like, whether it's affecting tubules, is it the membrane, is it the glomeruli itself? Because that can help us decide with you, which is the best part of therapy. And it's important to realize it's not a one-time procedure because it may be required. Again, if you have lupus nephritis and we treat you and you're doing well and we all hope and make sure that you do, but if things look like you're flaring and it's not responding, it's sometimes good to have a repeat picture to see if it's the same pattern you were having at the beginning. Has it changed to another type that requires a different type of therapy? Or has it now progressed to have scarring where it's best not to increase therapy, but to stay the course and prepare for something else, such as dialysis if it's needed? and therefore reduce any harm that you may have from not doing that and giving you unnecessary therapy. So what are the numbers that we're, uh, that we're concerned about in terms of this? So we have uh, the pictures of how much protein we will accept. And we're gonna go with what the Europeans do. They're very strict about this number. In America, the American College of Rheumatology, not since updated since 2012, call for a higher number. This is the number you need. You should have less than 0.5 uh, grams uh, uh, in your urine. Less than that is the best prognosis, 500 milligrams. That's what that is. And anything above that increases your risk of kidney decline, decrease in function. Very important you grasp, that's your bullseye. Um, when there's active disease, the treatment that we choose is aimed at reducing the proteinuria to less than 500 milligrams. And the faster we get there, the better you do. If you're still at this level and above 12 months, 24 months, it means you're at risk of having more renal progression and disease. Your doctor will also do a blood test and he will calculate the glomerular filtration rate. How good is that strainer working? And that's determined by a combination of your age, your weight, your creatinine level, as well as your gender. And the other number you need to know is 60. You wanna we have a function above 60. So if your number is below 60, you have to see, well, what can we do to get it higher than that so as to improve and maintain functions there? The kidney biopsy I mentioned, and again, in safe hands, which they always are, it's not done in the office, it's done by an expert, is very important to monitor your therapy and make treatment decisions. Very important. And I think all the community, rheumatology and nephrologists have certainly recognized this as well. And I've heard to that very 
very judiciously because it gives us the idea whether to change therapy, whether to continue, whether to discontinue if there's fibrosis and whether we should now be talking about any, um, any dialysis in the future. So how do we manage this? Well, immunosuppressants, as you know, is vital. And you heard about all of this with regards to the COVID vaccine and others. And I think uh, you're all familiar with them and they're powerful, effective, and when used appropriately and monitored, they're safe to be administered. Prednisone, you know, is the drug that we all love to hate, both patients and physicians, because you all know the side effects of this. And it's head to toe, cataracts, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, weight gain, osteoporosis, and so on. It is the future, and it is the now, that we've all banded together to realize that less is more that we wanna get you off those steroids as soon as possible. And we have uh, immunosuppressants that we combine with the steroids to spare the amount and the duration at which you get it because each milligram you get increases your risk of cardiovascular disease by 3%. So if you're on 10 milligrams, you have a 30% risk of having disease. What is the best dose of prednisone to be safe on? Zero. If you have to be on anything, the cutoffs, at least from the data from Hopkins, has said six milligrams, but less is more. You know, that's what we need. And that's important for us to do. It minimizes your cardiovascular risk. Hydroxychloroquine is another one to be aware of. They call it vitamin P. It reduces your flares, keeps your blood less sticky, reduces your cholesterol. It improves the efficacy of some of your drugs that you use, like mycophenolate and blood pressure control paramount. The less forces we're pushing through that kidney, the better it works. And there are selective blood pressure medicines that also help in decreasing protein, protein loss, like the, um, the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs, and your doctors will discuss that with you. So living with it goes beyond that. And uh, we heard about working with the rheumatologist and nephrologist, how to learn about disease and other things that we do day to day, not just for for a lupus or lupus nephritis, but our general health and mental state. And it's important for you to work as a team with individuals and that team, a lot of people because lupus presents with these myriad of things, lots of things. So, you know, you may, you see the rheumatologist as my patients do, I always share them with nephrology when they have lupus nephritis, regardless of what class they see a, a nephrologist as well. The, the others they see is the skin because a lot of my drugs will work on the skin, but when it is not within the control of my uh, threshold or the patient's, dermatology sees and see what else they can add to it. And you see the list of specialists that can be involved when you have disease. A pathologist who's experienced in reading all this histology, and especially in the kidney, is a priceless thing to have. A pharmacist who knows you when your medications are running low, and when you're given new medications, especially for your lupus nephritis, the potential for interaction, priceless. You have to know that and have that as well. And then, you know, it's a stressful disease like any chronic disease. And you may have the need of a psychologist as well. The primary care provider we need because they are the experts who manages the comorbidity and they keep your vaccination schedule on track. Because here we are trying to preserve a disease that's a challenge by giving immunosuppressions. Why not avoid the things we can? And therefore, your vaccination schedules should be up to date and, uh, and uh, intact. So you work with your health team, I think, to keep your medical appointments. Boy, this is one of my things in some of my populations, the no-show rate of my patients. And it's because they have real lives. And I get it. I get it. So we're working on projects to improve that to make the best use of their time with the doc, write down the key things you're having, write down the questions before, know your numbers. So when you go, you ask for them and you can discuss them. Always bring your medications and especially because it's a disease where you may see plenty or different specialists, bring the medications with you because you can't pronounce them. Guess what? Sometimes I can't either when they're ordered by other physicians, but we can look to make sure they're working together, not against you, and working to make your lupus better. 
And if you have somebody who can come with you, because sometimes you forget stuff, or sometimes they see something that you haven't seen, and it bothers them about you, and that's important to have. I have done much of this, and it's been very good for the patients. But this is all have been turned upside down, of course, with the pandemic. And you heard about that, and none of us wants to relive that again. But telemedicine actually came to the rescue. But we can still achieve all of this with uh, telecare. And uh, the thing is to, again, have your questions ready because you have a time slot. And for that time slot, it is best for you also to have your uh, internet working, not like I had today without the slides up. You have to have everything on there. And while he's talking, it's good to use the chat feature. Now, be presentable, meaning if they need to see a rash or a joint, make sure it's easily visible for the physician. And if you had labs done before or from another doctor, it's good to have that there to share with them. That's very useful. If you can do your temperature and pulse rate, great. The blood pressure a little easier because it's automated. And if you have a schedule to share to say what it's going and what it's been doing, I think that's also very useful for the physicians. Beyond that, it's important also to eat right. And every physician that you go to tells you this, at least I hope so. And you all know for hypertension and kidney disease, it's good to have not too much salt. And everything in America has salt and sugar. So you have to be careful with that. And therefore, it's better to cook your meat, meals, have fresh vegetables, fresh food, because the processed food, which is so easy, and we have all this Uber Eats and these meals in boxes, sometimes they have processed food and they work against us rather than with us. Um, high quality protein, size of the palm of your hand is good for you. Chicken, fish, sardines are great as well with the fish oils in it, those are perfect. And again, the fruits and vegetables to keep everything in homeostasis and talk to them about this. You should be on calcium and vitamin D for your bones. Vitamin D is important for uh, lupus patients because they have a good line of defense when you have a good vitamin D level. And it is very common for me to see, especially in African-Americans, low vitamin D levels, like six, and you should be at 30. So work with your physician to get your vitamin D up, and it should get to 40, as recommended by the Hopkins cohort. And when you get there, keep the vitamin D at that level. So you may have to take replacement therapy in addition to your daily vitamin D source, the replacement once a week. And if it's very low, sometimes twice a day, week to play catch up so that you can get that there. Exercise is important. And when you're feeling lousy, when you have the stress of disease, who wants to do that? So I would say start low, go slow, but get it done. And there are very many ways to do this now. And uh, the whole COVID experience created so many things new. And you can do a lot of exercises at home. You know, there's YouTube. It teaches you a lot. And you have a lot of things you can do there. But it's important you do that for the mind, because we know that stress can flare lupus. It is good for the bones, because we know that some of the medications like prednisone can weaken the bone. It is good for the muscles and tendons, keeps it strong. And the tendons in lupus, especially the on prednisone, can become weakened and can strain, they can tear, or they can rupture. And if we can keep the muscles and tendons strong, we can work to prevent that. And we can prevent falls so that we don't get fractures if we're on long dose, long uh, duration and doses of prednisone. So walking is good. Swimming is excellent to get your aerobic state up, to get those joints moving. Doesn't do well for osteoporosis, so we need land exercises to do that. And the stretching and yoga, as I said, both for the tendons and the muscles and the yoga for the mind. You really have to learn to deal with stress and how to manage it. And I know it's not easy, but we all have to learn. The other thing not mentioned here is sleep. And you really need to have good sleep hygiene. And you really need to get in the same time every night and get good restful sleep in other to embrace the, the challenge here and to cope and to manage disease. Use the exercise equipment. If you have significant disease, you may want to talk to us first to make sure your cardiovascular system is good, 
and especially coronary vessels. You are your own best advocate, and I hope that the information I've shared has equipped you well to take care of this when you go to your physician. And uh, you know, you know now what to ask your doctor when you're going about your kidney. What are the results of my last lab? You can ask this now, why? Because you know your numbers. You know that your protein has to be less than 0.5 grams. You know that your GFR filtration rate function should be over 60. Give him your blood pressure reading. Ask, are my kidneys already damaged? The subtext there is to say, have you checked? Are you sure it is safe? Is it damaged? And if so, how do we proceed? Ask, how will my kidney function be measured to make sure that he's actually doing that protein measurement and the GFR so you can have your numbers? Is there a way to tell how much severe my lupus nephritis will become? Meaning, have you considered doing a kidney biopsy if one has not been done? And what are the challenges and complications I can expect? That is, what are the adverse effects of the medications you're recommending so that I can understand and look out and agree with what we're deciding? How can I prepare for them? How can I minimize their effects? And how can I look forward to having control of my disease and prepare for a good outcome? So be engaged and stay informed. Understand what your risk is, that it's pretty high if you have lupus to have some form of kidney disease, but to catch it early. And you do that by looking for the symptoms, but also looking out for routine exams. And it has to be vigilant. You have to be judicious with it. It has to be every three months. Go in there and get it done. It's only a urine and a lab test. Discuss your options. I said to you at the beginning, I've never seen two patients alike. It's individualized and know what that is as well. And also um, continue to learn. Um, talk to the community individuals. Forums such as this are very good to have understanding of the disease. It's just a morning session and can change your life forever. And then you have other programs that embraces the lupus nephritis community where you can receive more information on this to do. And I'm gonna ask Mark to step in here to tell you about the all-in program for lupus nephritis. Mark? Yes, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Carr. Excellent presentation, and as always, uh, you do a fantastic job. Thanks very much. So as uh, Dr. Carr said, I'm gonna share a little bit of information about all-in for lupus nephritis program. So the all-in, literally from the name of the program through to the content and, and its resources, was developed using feedback and insights provided directly from the, from the uh, lupus and lupus nephritis community. Uh, the program offers a website, www.allinforln.com, and I, actually I think it'll, uh, there it is in the lower left-hand part of the screen, uh, with information about signs and symptoms of lupus nephritis, diagnosis of the disease, as well as tips for managing lupus nephritis once diagnosed. Now you can hear directly also uh, from people that uh, are living with lupus nephritis and their personal journeys, including their challenges and their triumphs. Next slide, please, Dr. Carter. All right, so to help raise awareness of, of lupus nephritis and to empower those living with the condition, All In has created the Lupus Nephritis Awareness Kit with insights from members of the community. Inside the kit, you'll find resources to help increase uh, your understanding of lupus nephritis, along with tips to help manage your disease. And you can register for the All In community and the kit through the All In website, www.allinforln.com forward slash register. And I actually think that that link will be on the next slide. Uh, but once registered, you'll have the immediate access to all the digital resources with a link provided in a uh, confirmation email. Now, the kit shown here will be uh, mailed uh, to the address that you provide. Uh, members of the All In community also receive seasonal uh, e-newsletters like the one shown here with updates on events happening in the community. Uh, new information about lupus nephritis and health and wellness tips, including uh, kidney-friendly uh, recipes. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, again, thank you so much for, for joining us today. You know, staying informed and connected to, to the lupus and lupus nephritis communities is a great way to, to advocate for yourself and to get the most out of your treatment plan. And joining this session today, I, I hope, is, is, a, is one solid uh, step toward that. And I hope you uh, stay connected to the lupus nephritis community moving forward. And I believe that moves us to the Q&A session, Amy, please. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Kerr. That was really great information. Um, if any of you have questions, we, we do have a question in the Q&A, but if any of you have any questions, please uh, go ahead and type them in the Q&A section. Um, the first question is, when would physicians find it appropriate to complete a kidney biopsy? So when they uh, see you at the first time and they do their physical exam and do their labs, if you have no proteinuria, there's no indication to have a kidney biopsy. If your threshold, the threshold is if you're above 500 milligrams, some people go a little higher, like 700 milligrams, then it's best to do a kidney biopsy. And you discuss that with him and come to a mutual understanding. Um, we, we had a question that was sent to us in advance. And I think a lot of people um, with SLE wonder about nephritis and about, you know, should that be something, how, how often does lupus turn into uh, Right. So, you know, the, the, the descriptions I gave of the 300,000 who have the disease, about 100,000 in this country are living with lupus in a population of 380 million. It doesn't sound like a lot, does it? But if you think about the toll it takes on the individual, on the family, who they live with, the amount of hospitalizations, doctor's visits, resources, and the mental toll, it is significant. So it is something that we're aware of and therefore try to detect early. If we look at the kidney of everybody who has lupus, we're going to find some little inflammation in the kidney. That's well known. When we talk about lupus nephritis requiring therapy, we talk about the more severe forms of the disease, class 3, 4, 5, and so on. And that occurs in about 45% to 50% of the patients who have lupus which is why it's important to always keep checking your urine so we can detect it early because we have much better ways now to treat it and control it. Uh, great, thank you. Another question. Um, my rheumatologist told me when I got diagnosed that the chances of worsening of the disease was pretty low. Here, you were saying that we need to keep an eye on symptoms since one out of three lupus might lupus might develop into nephritis. Yeah, so should so I advocate for more exams? To keep right. a close eye? So I think uh, you should recommend or advocate, yes, advocate to at least have the urine checked every three months. Okay. Now you may have had lupus for 20 years. It's never been there. The urine is always normal. You can compromise maybe in say four months, five months, etc. But I've always been surprised by this disease. I've had patients who have had it for so long and then they walk in with lupus nephritis. And we picked it up because we kept checking. We kept mm -hmm. checking. Um, I have had two kidney biopsies with, two, with different results. Is that normal? Should I expect my lupus nephritis to keep changing? So that is a perfect example of why we make everyone aware that there is the possibility of having more than one biopsy, not just at the beginning, to diagnose it and see what type it is, but going forward to see if the type remains the same or changes. You have had two. And if you respond or with the therapy was changed based on that second biopsy, then there is benefit for it. Going forward, if you continue that same pattern or if something isn't quite right, you may require another one. So it all depends on your individual labs, your individual uh, profile, whether repeat one is needed. But yes, it can be done more than once, more than twice, because things change. And it's important to know that to select the right therapy or to decide there is no further increase in therapy needed. Is there a particular type of urine test that is best to detect protein in the blood? So they do uh, urine and they do the lab and they calculate something called a urine to protein creatinine ratio, which is a calculation which is readily available to the lab, to the physician, anyone who does it. But you have to have both done. So once you do that and the labs are ordered, it's sort of automatic, the calculation. This is a good question. Can you walk through what to expect during a kidney biopsy? Is it invasive, non-invasive, local anesthesia? Is there recovery time afterwards? Thanks in advance. So the biopsy is a, a procedure, like you go for an endoscopy, for example, but a different thing. You are vetted to make sure that whatever can cause any potential risk is excluded.
for example, blood thinners. They'll talk to you about anti-inflammatories. Your blood pressure has to be controlled for you to do that. You have to have no current infection for you to do it. And once that is done, you're scheduled for this and the thing is done. So it's, I don't wanna say it's minimal risk, but it's very low risk procedure when done appropriately at the right time, fine. And it is essential that we get the tissue to see the picture that's in the kidney, but it's done in a safe environment. It is considered routine in the evaluation of lupus nephritis and is very ne necessary for appropriate management. Great, thank you. Um, I, she was asking, is there anesthesia involved? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, uh, local or uh, what we call conscious sedation at most. I don't see any more questions, so we will wrap this up to get to our next speaker. I want to thank Dr. Kerr for being here with us today and sharing this great information. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, thank you so much, Mark, for also being here today. We appreciate um, everyone um, and your involvement. So thank you so much, Dr. Kerr. Thank you for having me. Have a good